Now, who's this? That's this uh, is Secretary Rusk with Dick Goodwin. Dick Goodwin came with us about three years ago. He was Felix Frankfurter's law clerk. He had a brilliant record at uh, Harvard Law School and has been working as an assistant, and he's been particularly concerned with uh, Latin America, which has been a matter of special interest to us. And therefore, our program on Latin America and its implementation now have fallen into uh, Dick Goodwin's hands largely. He, he, he works on the messages, that's right. Wow, that is President John F. Kennedy speaking to NBC News in 1961 about a young staffer named Dick Goodwin. Joining us now is Pulitzer Prize winning author, presidential historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. Her new book out today is titled An Unfinished Love Story, A Personal History of the 1960s, part memoir, part biography of her and her late husband, Dick Goodwin. Doris, it's so great to see what you've written a lot of books. This one is special for all the obvious reasons. So much, we were just talking about boxes and boxes that Dick had from his years <laughs> serving under President Kennedy. Um, how did you approach such a personal project differently, obviously, than all the other biographies you've written? Well, it did start because he had saved 300 boxes that really were a time capsule of the 60s because he not only worked for John Kennedy, he worked for with Jackie Kennedy. He worked for LBJ as his chief speechwriter. He was with McCarthy, Senator McCarthy in New Hampshire, which was Bobby Kennedy when he died. So he's just like Zelig. He's everywhere there. But he wouldn't open these boxes. It made me so upset because I knew there was great stuff in them because he was so sad at the way the decade had ended. Martin Luther King killed. He was with Bobby Kennedy when he died. And the riots in the streets and the violence and the anti-war movement. Um, finally, he turns 80, he comes down the stairs. It's time, it's time, it's wow. now or never, if I have any wisdom to dispense. So we spent the last years of his life reliving the 60s, reliving our youth. I mean, I was in my 70s when he did this, he's in his 80s, and we started with Kennedy, and we went right up to the end of the decade together. You know, at one point, he did show me something out of the boxes. Dick and I were talking about the war and Lyndon Johnson, and he went and got an old speech that he had written for Lyndon Johnson prior to his departure. And he had notations on the side indicating, you know, he didn't know which way Johnson would go on the war, but we now know. What was Dick's mood then that you reflect, re reflected on, having looked at everything in the boxes? His mood toward Lyndon Johnson and the increased escalation in Vietnam. You know, one of the things that happened for Dick and me was that I was such a Johnson loyalist. I had ended up working for him in the last days of his White House and then helped him on his memoirs. And while I had been an anti-war activist, I had such great respect for what he did domestically, Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, immigration reform, everything. And Dick was a Kennedy loyalist, and there was a fault line between the two. So. After the war escalated, he resented Johnson so much. He had loved him so much. He was involved in, in doing the Selma speech right after Bloody Sunday. It was Dick's proudest moment in public life, that incredible joint session speech. And after that speech was over, where Johnson went right out for voting rights, talked about the idea of what America stood for and how we had the freedom riders and the people who were marching were the real heroes. They had made this happen. He said, God, how I loved Lyndon Johnson, how I could never have imagined that two years later I'd be marching against him in the streets. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. That was the moment when, as you know, um, he, he went out. When he was working on that speech, he had only that day to work on that speech, nine hours that day. He comes in at nine. He has to be ready at six. And he put his watch away as if he would put his watch away. He wouldn't have to worry about time. It was kind of crazy. And he kept working. P pages were going out to Lyndon Johnson, who's screaming outside, but knows that he can't pressure Dick because he's only got that day to write the speech. And then finally he takes a break. He has to have a cigar. Mike and he used to smoke cigars together. And he went out and he heard these young people singing, We Shall Overcome. He came back in and then he added that passage into the speech after he talked about not a northern problem, not a southern problem, not a states' right problem, not a constitutional problem. The constitutional command is clear. It's not even a moral problem to deny your fellow Americans the right to vote. It's wrong. It's dead wrong. And then he was able to say, but even if we get this done, the full blessings will take a lot longer, but we have to fight for it and we shall overcome. And that's the moment when change happens, right. as you know, Eddie, when the outside movement fires the conscience of the people and it happens. So he had loved him so much and then he got so angry that the war had undone things. But in those last years of his life, this was what, man, you know, you saw us in those last years, Mike. He re retained a, a remembrance of what was great about Lyndon Johnson, what was great about the country before the war. And he began to come to terms with Johnson. Mm -hmm. and, and it made him a happier person. It made him feel fulfilled that he had done something that mattered, that the country had done something great that mattered. And it was all still there despite the war in Vietnam.
down. Doris, we have an extraordinary audio clip we want to play for you. This is a 1964 conversation between President Johnson and his press secretary, Bill Moyers. It was this conversation that set the stage for Dick Goodwin's return to the White House, though he wouldn't know it took place until decades later. Since Sarnes left, we got no one that can be phonetic and get rhythm. Uh, the only person I know who can, and I'm reluctant to ask him to get involved in this, because right now it's in our little circle, is Goodwin. Well, I just asked him if he can't put some sex in it. I asked him if he couldn't put some rhyme in it and some beautiful Churchillian phrases and take it and turn it out for us tomorrow if it just won't take off the day. And if it will, then we'll use it. But to uh, ask him if he can do it and call, call it tonight and say, I want to bring it to you now. I've got it ready to go. But he wants you to work on it if you can do it without getting in the car. No, I'm not sure about him right now. Tell him that I'm pretty impressed with him. He's working on Latin America already. See how he's getting along. But uh, can he put the music to it? Wow. Can he put the music to it? Can he put a little sex in it? And as, as we said, Dick didn't know that conversation had taken place until much later. What's what do you think when you hear that conversation? Oh, right. I mean, we were like nosy neighbors <laughs> listening on a party line, and he finally realized this is what got me to go to work for LBJ. And then, not long after that conversation, Dick, Dick is called to a meeting by Bill Moyers with Lyndon Johnson. They want to come up with the vision for what Johnson's program is going to be. He was getting the civil rights bill through, tax bill through. He wanted his own Johnson program. The meeting took place in a pool rather than in the <laughs> office. And they come, and Johnson slims swimming naked in the pool. Oh, wow. And there's Bill and Dick standing with their suits on. They don't have bathing suits. And he says, come on in, boys. Don't be squeamish. They, as they swim in the pool, he says, I want to have my own program. And they outline what will become the Great Society. And that becomes the first big speech that that my husband worked on. He comes up with the phrase Great Society, but it has in it Medicare, Medicaid, aid to education, all the things that will become the 89th Congress. So it all started naked in the pool, wow. paddling up and down. That's some, some image, George. For the history and, nerds. For the history nerds, Mike. And now you know <laughs> the rest of the story. Uh, well, thank you, Doris. Tomorrow we will get to the points we wanted to get to, but uh, this was far too interesting, especially <laughs> figuring out where all the greatest programs of the 20th century started mm. in that pool. pool. All right, thank you. Uh, the new book is an unfinished love story, a personal history of the 1960s. It goes on sale today. And we'll see you again all week, Doris. Thank all you. Week. I'll be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Still hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.